In 1808, the affairs of Europe were dominated by one military leader. That year, the French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte asserted his power by installing his own brother on the throne of Spain. This was the trigger for one of the bloodiest of all wars of resistance. The citizens of Madrid rose up against Napoleon's troops and the French response was a mass execution. The date was May the 3rd, 1808, a dark day in Spanish history. But it was this grim event that inspired the creation of an important historic painting by a genius of the Romantic Age, Goya. This canvas was the greatest achievement of a long and diverse career. Goya rose from humble beginnings to become the most famous Spanish artist of his day. He had an extraordinary life, during which he was tried for treason and brought before the Spanish Inquisition for a charge of obscenity. His success as an artist was also blighted by tragedy. In 1792, at the age of 46, he contracted a mysterious illness that almost killed him. It also left him permanently deaf. As war and division blighted his country, Goya's work became darker, more introspective. This was exacerbated by his deafness, which threatened to cut him off from the world around him. The results were often horrifying. In the artist's own time, his work brought him before the Spanish Inquisition and the end of his life was spent in exile. But by then, his achievements as an artist were little short of phenomenal. Goya is a key figure in the history of art. His works have a spontaneity and a directness that still appeals to us today. His works still shock and amaze us. And I think when we're looking at Goya, we get the sense that this was someone that knew what human nature was all about. Human nature with all its appetites and imperfections. Goya is an artist of profound human emotion. He wasn't a saint, he wasn't a hero, but he lived through the most incredibly troubled times and he bore witness to them. And I think one of the things that always strikes me about Goya is his tremendous honesty, the way that he is sort of showing the dark side as well as the bright side of human nature. He's a very earthy artist, as well as being one who can give you most wonderful lyrical colours. Goya painted everything, still lifes, landscapes, portraits, he painted religious works, history pictures, satirical prints. And by the end of his life, his attitude towards his art hadn't really changed at all. He was interested in the pursuit of truth, even if it meant painting things that were grotesque. He was a very talented painter, draftsman, lithographer, printmaker. He was a very talented observer and a brilliant inventor. More than anything, though, he tasted the fruits of success, if you like. He was a successful court painter, but also at the same time was able to produce very deep, very troubling sometimes, very imaginative art, which still has a power to shock and perplex even today. Francisco José Goya y Lucientes was born in the dusty plateau region of Aragon in the north of Spain on March the 30th, 1746. He was the third of five children born to poor parents. The small village where he spent his childhood, Fuende Todos, was not an affluent place, and Goya's father struggled to earn a living as a gilder. In Aragon, where he was born, there was a very strong tradition of church painting and he would have learned about the old masters probably through prints and drawings in the studio of the artist he studied with in Saragossa. He trained with an artist called Jose Luthan. Luthan was a local painter, one of whose jobs was actually to go around and revise indecent paintings. There were lots of paintings from the Renaissance and a little bit later that had nudes in them. The Inquisition didn't like these, so Luthan went around and painted drapery on. So although he was taught by Luthan, Goya really learnt on the job. He wasn't an academic artist. 
Whenever he entered competitions for the academy in Madrid, he usually failed because he didn't have those skills of draftsmanship and composition that the artists in the capital had learned. This was the center of the Spanish art scene. It was where the patronage of the court could make a painter rich. Madrid was also home to the Spanish Royal Academy. In 1764, this influential body was run by the neoclassical artist Anton Rafael Mengs. The previous year, he had invited another painter from Aragon, Francisco Bayer, to study at the academy. Bayer was 12 years older than Goya, and they knew each other well. But Goya's academy applications were both rejected. Disheartened, he returned to Saragossa, where he found work painting frescoes for local churches. It was a slow start to his career, but in 1770, he was able to make the traditional young artist's tour of Italy. Goya spent time in Rome, where the fluency of his painting made an impression. He obviously felt the need to get away from Spain because he went to Rome at his own expense. He says that he had no master except for his own invention and for the great artists whom he'd seen in Spain and in Italy. Goya was particularly influenced in the earlier part of his life by the great Spanish 17th century artist Velasquez and the equally great Dutch 17th century painter Rembrandt. And I think on the one hand Velasquez has this wonderful painterliness and uh, he is a court painter as Goya hopes to be and he manages to combine elegance with a very striking degree of realism. From Rembrandt perhaps we have the more mysterious, the darker side, the spirituality. Well, as well as those two, of course, there was also the influence of the current neoclassical movement, which does affect Goya in the early part of his career. His early work is relatively tight and severe, like a lot of neoclassical painting, though this is something that he gets rid of more and more after he comes back from Italy. Back in Saragossa, he received his first major church commissions. He also painted this self-portrait. Though our details of Goya's early life are sketchy, this confident image reveals a young painter whose technique was already impressive. By 1774, a number of commissions from local churches had made Goya the most successful artist of the region. He was now married to a local girl named Josefa. As far as we know, it was a happy marriage, though just one of their five children survived into adulthood. Josefa was the sister of Francisco Bayer, the Aragonese artist now well established in Madrid. In 1774, Goya was invited to work under Bayer in Madrid. His task was to paint large cartoon designs for the famous Royal Tapestry Factory. It was an important moment in his career. The 28-year-old artist was now on the fringes of high society, where valuable portrait commissions could be gained. His tapestry designs were also tailored to aristocratic tastes. These bright, carefree images revealed the influence of the popular Rococo manner. Images like this proved popular. But soon, Goya was revealing greater ambition in his tapestry designs. In 1777, he painted The Parasol, a work whose layout and color revealed a new sense of boldness in execution. One of the most striking features about it technically is the lightness and brightness of it, the way it's lit from underneath the figures almost. And that very lightness is in itself of interesting contrast to the more formal traditions of tapestry decoration. But I think the other thing is the contrast between the lights and the darks in the fabric of his cartoon in the sense that mostly tapestry cartoons were obviously designed to be made into tapestries which themselves couldn't or weren't usually associated with very heavy contrast between dark colours and white. They tended to be quite light in overall. They tended not to 
be very extreme in their contrast of, of lights and shade. The parasol is part of a series of popular amusements that was meant to go into the chambers of the Prince and the Princess of the Asturias. So in the parasol you've got a clear design, You've also got the appearance of two key figures, the Macho and the Macha. These are, if you like, working class dandies, very haughty, very proud, often getting into scrapes. They saw themselves as pure representatives of Castilian spirit, people that hadn't been contaminated by foreign intermarriage. So this is really Goya, for the first time, showing himself as a powerful recorder of Spanish pastimes and amusements. Tapestry design had a lowly artistic status. Large paintings such as this were not even seen as works of art in their own right. Goya was still not a member of the Royal Academy, but that was soon to change. In 1780, he painted a religious image that finally secured his entry to the heart of the Spanish art establishment, a depiction of Christ on the Cross we might consider the reasons why Goya chose this most sacred of subject matter for his Royal Academy submission. The crucifixion had been depicted in one of the best known works of Anton Raphael Mengs, the head of the Royal Academy, who had died only months before. Christ on the Cross had also been portrayed by a great Spanish artist of the past, the 17th century master, Diego Velasquez. Velasquez was regarded in Spain at the time as their great hero, and I think to some extent there had always been a bit of a puzzle as to why it was there had been these great painters in the 17th century, Velasquez, the barman and so on, and why there were none since. So there was always that idea of wanting to go back to the greats, wanting to go back to a great Spanish tradition. And I think a lot of the excitement about Goya was the idea that here was a painter who could once more pick up the gauntlet, who could follow in the footsteps of Velasquez. From the time he started working in the court, he would have had access to the king's collection of paintings. And it was there that he made his studies after Velasquez. And he made a series of prints that were published in 1778. And it's quite clear from looking at these copies that what he admired particularly was partly the way Velasquez painted light, partly the marvelous transparency of the way he could paint costume and gesture and also the way that Velasquez was much more interested in character and this mix of character from the elegant, beautiful women of the Habsburg court down to these grotesque, deformed dwarves is the kind of mix that Goya himself was obviously interested in establishing. According to Goya, Velasquez was one of three major influences upon his art. Another was nature itself. We can see this in the increasing mastery of landscape in his tapestry cartoons. His third formal influence was Rembrandt, the 17th century Dutchman whose greatest paintings were of people. In the 1780s, Goya began to reveal a similar enthusiasm for the art of portraiture. By the end of the decade, Goya was the most fashionable portraitist in Madrid. Full-length canvases were exactly what aristocratic patrons wanted. This is Don Manuel Osorio de Zuniga, a canvas depicting the four-year-old son of a Spanish count. Child portraiture was increasingly popular in the late 18th century. In England, Joshua Reynolds was just one artist who made a good living painting the younger members of wealthy families. With Goya's work, we see that he too was able to capture the spirit of childhood. I think what strikes the viewer of this picture very powerfully are the bold contrasts of the scarlet skeleton suit, essentially, and the peculiarly lit and therefore rather pallid face of the little boy and also the contrast between the same scarlet and the greens of the background. Technically as well, it's a rather dazzling display of the portrayal of different kinds of fabric, from the rough to the, the very kind of rich and sumptuous silk of the sash. 
And of course, there's something of the, the strange and grotesque almost about the portrayal of the animals in the picture, which people are always captivated by. Something which reminds one, again, of Velázquez. Don Manuel de Zuniga is not only a sparkling portrait, it's also an emblematic illustration of what childhood is all about. This is down to the ancillary animals that you see in the painting. So you've got these three sinister looking cats staring at the magpie with Goya's calling card in its beak. And on the other side you've got the caged birds. It's been suggested that this is all about the loss of innocence. Innocence at first is protected, if you like, caged. And then gradually through experience uh, you come into the world and are preyed upon, if you like, by the sort of uh, cat figures. By the early 1790s, Portrait commissions like this had made Goya a wealthy man. He was now one of the king's official court painters. He was also deputy director of the Royal Academy. His cartoons now took up less of his time, and in 1792, he gave up tapestry design altogether. He was now a major figure in Madrid society a fine achievement for a man of humble provincial origin. But a cruel twist of fate lay ahead. Goya's life and work would never be the same again. Late in 1792, whilst traveling to Andalusia, Goya was struck with a debilitating illness. The cause or exact nature of the ailment remains unknown although many have speculated on lead poisoning, a common ingredient in the paints of that day. He continued to Cadiz, a major medical centre of the time, and convalesced with the wealthy merchant and friend, Sebastian Martinez. Whatever the illness, the consequences were devastating. Goya nearly died, and was forced to rest for a year. Goya was now permanently deaf. Unsurprisingly, Goya's mood plunged into the depths of despair. But as he recovered what was left of his health, his imagination began to run wild. He decided to incorporate his personal visions into a series of paintings that mark the turning point of his career. Images such as this depiction of a shipwreck are known as the cabinet pictures. Equally bleak is this painting of the madhouse at Zaragoza. Scenes like this could be witnessed in asylums across Europe. The English painter Hogarth memorably depicted London's notorious Bedlam institution. But Goya's madhouse is a far darker place. Trapped in his silent world, paintings like this began to flow from the stricken artist's brush. Before he goes deaf, he talks a lot about listening to folk songs, going to concerts, watching people dance. And music was obviously something that interested him a great deal. And wordplay and argument and this kind of thing. He writes a letter about his convalescence and he says that during the period of convalescence, one of the advantages was that because he was no longer under pressure to produce work for patrons or at the court, he could paint more or less what he liked. Goya seems to dwell much more on subjects from the imagination and subjects that deal with a satirical and absurd view of human nature. Goya was also very keen on money and he wanted to find some way of replacing the income he lost from official commissions by painting small, interesting private works. In one of the very famous letters he writes after his illness, he says that one of the reasons he chooses subjects of fantasy was because they were much more easily saleable. Goya's deafness led to an increasing reliance on the power of his imagination. It is this, more than anything, that secures his status as an artist of the Romantic age. But his loss of hearing did not change his life completely. He continued to carry out conventional commissions to great acclaim. In 1798, he painted The Miracle of St. Anthony at Madrid's Church of San Antonio 
de la Florida. He was still in demand for portrait commissions, and the resulting images reveal a painter now at the pinnacle of his career. They may also reveal an artist still able to enjoy the physical pleasures of life. This is the Duchess of Alba, one of the leading society beauties of the day. In the early 1790s, Goya was introduced to her through her husband, the Duke of Alba. The following year, the Duke died, and Goya went to stay on the Duchess's estate. One painting in particular would give rise to the speculation that the two were lovers. This was Goya's portrait of the Duchess of Alba. On the ground beneath her feet, we see the words, Solo Goya, only Goya. A lot has been made of their relationship, but there is no hard evidence to suggest that there was anything more than friendship involved. We know that Goya spent the summer of 1796 at the Duchess's country estate at San Lucar near Cadiz, but he was probably there as an invited guest, painting and drawing, acting a bit like a, a kind of librarian might do. He had that same kind of social position in the family. We know that the Duchess of Alba was very kind to all of her servants, and so maybe Goya misinterpreted these signals. He probably did feel some close attachment to her, but it wasn't reciprocated. If Goya did enjoy an affair with the Duchess of Alba, then it would be in keeping with certain contemporary descriptions of his character. Some said that Goya was a passionate ladies' man, it appears that he had a taste for a masculine lifestyle. He enjoyed shooting, and his wealth enabled him to drive a fashionable English carriage. But details of Goya's private life are generally missing. In this canvas from the 1790s, we can see a free spirit at work. His hat is circled with candles, a procedure that enabled him to work in twilight. Goya's brushwork is very distinctive. When he first started painting, he was very much influenced by neoclassicism and he tended to paint in a rather thin way. But the brush gets bolder and bolder. And towards the end, I think one can see he's not just painting with a brush, he's also drawing with the brush. He's shaping his forms with the brush in a very bold, uninhibited way. So I think it's that boldness that perhaps singles him out from other painters of his period. He wasn't just an innovator with paint, he was an innovator with all kinds of technique of visual representation. From printmaking, he tried his hand at dry point, at aqua tint, lithography even at the end of his life, which was very new. And of course, his fresco painting is extraordinary in its bravery and novelty. I mean, it's still recognised as being an extraordinary kind of technique, which rather broke the rules of how fresco was normally painted. And so I think we have to see the round of achievement of Goya. He's not someone who can just deal with one medium particularly well. He's one person who seems to be able to spread that talent for innovation and creation right across a range of artistic media. By the beginning of the 19th century, Goya's technical skills were unrivaled amongst Spanish artists of the day. His portraiture was now fully mature. Increasingly, he was commissioned to paint female subjects dressed as Mahas, the seductive female counterpart to the Maho. The Maha wore a trademark costume, a bodice surmounted with a black lace mantilla. We can see this in the many Goya portraits of wealthy society ladies. The Duchess of Alba donned the Maha uniform when she sat for the artist who may have been her lover. Assumptions that the Duchess also modelled for his erotic paintings, the Maha naked and the Maha clothed, are unfounded, although they were originally in her collection. The sheer sexuality of these paintings proved too much for some. And because of them, Goya faced the full force of Spanish conservatism.
but with this image from 1805, there were no such difficulties. This is Donna Isabel de Porcel, a society woman who had also chosen to be depicted as a spirited maha. One feature one often sees in Goya with these very strong pictures is a, a tremendous use of the profile. She is a very vibrant woman and you can see once again that he's managed to combine elegance and sensuality in the work itself. Recently there has been some discussion about it, particularly about its authenticity. We know that Doña Isabel de Porcel sat to Goya in the 1800s in his Madrid studio. And if that is the picture that he produced, it was painted over a portrait of someone in a dark blue outfit. We don't know if it's male or female. Now what's happened in the intervening years is that the blue of the outfit has come through on Doña Isabella's face and it has given a very porcelain hue to the skin tones which makes it look rather like a sort of rather pretty late Victorian girl. So there has been quite a lot of discussion about it. Several front rank Goya scholars feel that it's unacceptable as a work by Goya. Others defend it very fiercely. This is a group portrait of King Charles IV, surrounded by the royal family. Typically, a commission like this would be a study in majesty and dignity. But Goya chose to depict the family as individuals with personalities. In the case of King Charles, the result is hardly flattering. It is the Queen who is the dominant figure here. This is a portrait which is often regarded as, in some way, a cheeky portrait, a portrait which, if you like, deconstructs the Spanish royal family. I think though that is to misunderstand the tradition of informality in Spanish royal portraits. It stretches back to, for example, Meng's portrait of Charles III. And I think the real bravery of this is to show the family as family. That, you know, the strength of this portrait is that this is a family gathering, and the centre of that family is the Queen. Right in the centre, you've got the King and the Queen, Maria Luisa. Maria Luisa is much more highlighted. She was the real power in the land. So maybe that's a kind of concession to the realities of power. What's also odd is that Goya's seen painting them behind. A painter would never set up his easel behind his group and paint their back, so why is Goya in there? I think there are two reasons for that. Velázquez, in his great paintings Las Meninas, places himself, the artist at work, as a kind of uh, elaborate signature. But I think we can also think about the painting if we try to visualise a mirror in front of them. So Goya and the royal family are both staring into the same mirror. So if what Goya paints and what they see are the same thing, there can't be any argument. The acceptance of this unusually honest portrait of the Spanish royal family may reveal the esteem in which the artist was held. Goya was now first painter to the king, the highest status that a Spanish artist could achieve. But he had no interest in winding down his career. The most radical stage of his working life was just beginning. This partly stemmed from the desperate political situation that characterized the age. Goya's greatest ever painting was inspired by the French occupation of his country. But many of his later masterpieces were also inspired by intense personal visions. In 1799, he completed his first great achievement in printmaking. A typical example is Now They Are Sitting Pretty, a print that mocks the eternal phenomenon of feminine vanity. Los Caprichos was a series of 80 aquatint etchings that satirized the follies of his fellow humans. Others depict scenes whose horrors are almost unimaginable. The best known of all the Caprichos prints is also a dark and melancholy work. It can also be seen as a defining image of the Romantic Age. This is The Sleep of Reason Produces Monsters. 
Gaia's Sleep of Reason is one of those images that has struck people over the centuries and it remains, I think, a very powerful work for people. Perhaps, first of all, because of the way in which it shows the artist as an involuntary witness. That, I think, is a very original idea at the time. Goya is associated with the Romantic movement and that idea that the artist is a kind of visionary, is a kind of prophet, is somebody who can see the darkness as well as the light, can see what other people can't see. This idea, I think, is expressed in that picture, but what is unique for Goya is not only expressing that idea, but that the idea that he cannot help himself, that it's involuntary, that he has to bear the witness whether he likes it or not. Originally, he wasn't going to call his series of prints caprichos, which means simply caprices. He was going to call them sueños, which means dreams. The translation is nearly always given as the sleep of reason produces monsters. And this seems like a very straightforward idea. When you're asleep or you're unconscious or you're not fully in control of yourself, like a sick person or a drunk person, then your imagination can riot out of control. However, sueño can also mean dream. And if you translate it slightly differently, meaning the dream of reason produces monsters, that suggests that reason itself is somehow irrelevant or diseased or doesn't really have a lot to do with human behavior. Much of the 18th century, of course, had been concerned with reason. The Enlightenment was concerned with reason. The European thinking of the Enlightenment had all but passed Spain by. Many Spanish people still lived lives dominated by absurd superstitions. Such irrational belief can be seen in this unsettling Goya canvas depicting the so-called burial of the sardine, a contemporary ritual that marked the beginning of the 40 days of Lent. The common people that we see here could easily have been painted by Hieronymus Bosch in the 16th century. But this painting was created in the 1810s. Compared with many of its European neighbors, Spain was intellectually backward, and the cause was not difficult to identify. The Spanish Inquisition was still a powerful force in the land, though its worst excesses had died out. Heretics and Jews were not now put to a terrible death by the hundred. In Goya's time, the Inquisition was more concerned with censorship, a task that its officers pursued with relish. Enlightenment was not to their taste, and provocative satirical art was unlikely to make a favourable impression. Clearly, the Inquisition did not approve of Goya's Caprichos series, and they were severely condemned. The Inquisition was officially known as the Holy Office, so it was investigating heresy um, and is also investigating immorality. Now, I think in Protestant countries we've got this image of the Inquisition as being brutal and torturing people at the drop of a hat. This actually wasn't quite true. The Inquisition was forced to go through its own legal process, but it's clear that the Inquisition was a very conservative institution. And of course with the changes that were being introduced into Europe, the French Revolution, pleas for democracy. This kind of upset the balance in Spain, so the Inquisition was extremely powerful in trying to retain the status quo. It would not be the last time that Goya faced the reactionary force of the Spanish Inquisition. In 1815, he was brought before them to answer a charge of obscenity. The inquisitors were displeased with the artist's two erotic paintings of the reclining Maha. Goya was not convicted, but it is difficult not to be astonished by the whole affair. Another feature of Spanish life in the early 19th century was its weak and corrupt government under Charles IV. Many Spaniards cheered when he was overthrown by his son Ferdinand in March 1808, but their joy was short-lived. Shortly afterwards, Napoleon sent French troops to occupy Madrid. By May the 13th, his brother Joseph sat on the throne of Spain and a grim war of resistance had begun.
it was a conflict of unusual bloodshed and cruelty, and the greatest Spanish artist of the time sought to capture its horror. In 1810, he began to create another major series of prints, The Disasters of War. Like the Caprichos series, these were etchings accompanied by an enigmatic title. In this case, there is no remedy. This 1811 print could equally well be a comment on many horrors of the 20th century. The war against the French also inspired Goya's work in paint. Here we see a depiction of the very first act of Spanish resistance on May the 2nd, 1808. A contingent of French troops is attacked by the citizens of Madrid, and the result is a swirling mass of violence. Brutality is shown in equal measure from both the French and Spanish factions. The French commander's response to the events of May the 2nd was brutal. He ordered the execution of dozens of Spanish citizens. Some of them had been involved in the insurrection. Others were innocent members of the public who just happened to be there. This was the subject matter for one of the greatest works of art ever created. The 3rd of May, 1808. Goya's masterpiece. The 3rd of May is a wonderfully dramatic painting. It was painted not at the time of the uprising in 1808. It was painted in 1814, uh, several years later, at a time when Goya was trying to ingratiate himself with the Spaniards and show that he was a true patriot after all. And yet its appearance is so compelling that people often believe it must have been painted on the spot. It has that kind of eyewitness look to it, even though probably Goya was nowhere near the event at the time. They're not dying like heroes, sort of singing the national song or anything like that. They're throwing their hands up in despair. They feel hopeless. They feel completely bereft. And that sort of deep humanity, I think, is the thing that comes out of the picture. Goya's creation of a kind of depiction of street conflict, of a kind of warfare which takes place in an urban setting, I think did have some influence over the large-scale rhetorical creations, for example, of Delacroix, Liberty Leading the People. Obviously, the, the formal influence is very clear when one looks at Manet's execution of Maximilian, for example, that technique of bringing the executioner and the executed so close together to almost sort of cut out that distance which allows one to feel that all of this is nice and controlled. That, I think, Manet took very much directly from Goya. This amazing work was Goya's greatest response to the conflict that engulfed his country. But it was not the only one. In 1812, he completed The Colossus, a forbidding image whose terrifying giant can be seen as representing the horror of war itself but the tiny people below are equally dramatic. The freedom of Goya's brushwork captures the sense of panic, movement and fear. Their tiny proportion suggests that there is nowhere that anyone can run to when war consumes the land. Only in 1814, after six years of fighting, did King Ferdinand VII return to the Spanish throne but his realm remained divided. Under French occupation, the Inquisition had been abolished. Ferdinand restored it, and it was now that Goya had to defend himself against its officers. The artist also found himself in trouble with the regular law. In 1811, at the height of the conflict, Goya had sworn allegiance to Joseph Bonaparte, with the French defeated, he now faced a trial for treason. I don't think there's any doubt that Goya did work for Joseph. He was also awarded the Royal Order of Spain that was colloquially called the Aubergine um, as, as an order of decoration. In some ways, Goya's position is pretty indefensible. But like so many other liberals, he in 
a perverse way welcomed the French because they bought a kind of sense of democracy. They also bought an end to many of the Spanish institutions like the Inquisition. One of the ways of countering this charge was to show that he was himself a patriot. And this is why he petitioned the king for permission to paint the two famous paintings, the 2nd and 3rd of May, which were commemorating the bloody events that had caught the French had perpetrated when they first took over. So this was to demonstrate the degree of his commitment and the pain that he'd felt about the invasion. Perhaps another point to bear in mind is that the series of disasters of war which he made at etchings during the occupation from about 1810 onwards were never published in his lifetime. So these were private works. Nobody actually knew they were there. Clearly he didn't want the French to see them when he was there. Probably for that reason nobody would have thought up to 1814 that he had expressed any sentiments on behalf of the Spanish insurgents. From 1815 onwards, Goya began to play less of a role in public life. It was an understandable decision. He was now a widower approaching his 70s in a deeply divided country. Increasingly, he passed his days in his country house outside Madrid, working on his third major series of prints depicting the follies of man. Goya was now entering the last stage of his life, and death seemed imminent in 1819, when he was again struck down with illness. But thanks to his doctor, Eugene Arietta, the 73-year-old artist pulled through. Typically, Goya turned the experience into art. This 1820 portrait shows Arietta attending to his stricken patient as death-like masks are revealed through a background of darkness. What you see there is this very solid figure of the doctor tending with great firmness Goya, who at the same time seems to be almost slipping away. There's a kind of slight tilt to his head and the left side of his head and the right as we look at it almost seems to be fading into the distance, as if the Doctor is actually holding him back from that strange darkness in the background where those figures are kind of half emerging. So it's like the Doctor holding him on the threshold of life and death. That's portraiture as drama, conveying a, almost a narrative. There must be very, very few life-size paintings of the artist as sick. The painting himself, of course, has some very strange features because apart from the fact that the artist appears to be in the arms of his Doctor, there are heads that seem to swim out of the murk of the background. And we don't know really what these heads signify, who they are. Are they real people? Are they not real people? Are they monster figures? Are they portraits of friends who've come to see the artist on his sickbed? Goya had just moved into his country house, known as the House of the Deaf Man. It is in probably one of the upstairs rooms of the house, which Goya later painted, that this strange scene takes place. Over the following three years, he painted the interior walls of the deaf man's house. He allowed his imagination to run wild. The result was the final great achievement of a remarkable career, the black paintings. These 14 works were like nothing ever seen before. They were termed the black paintings, not for their dark colouring, but for the dark nature of the subject matter. Here we see two old people eating, a painting whose furious impasto brushwork informs the image with dynamism and immediacy. This is an entirely imaginative work, a dark image whose approach can also be seen in what is, for many, the blackest of all the black paintings. This is the insane god Saturn eating his child in case it grows up to usurp him. Goya, by this stage, is elderly, and he starts to focus, I think, on death and the passage of time as subject matter. But of course, one of the problems when we're dealing with the paintings of the Quinta del Sordo is the fact that they've been removed from the walls, they've been restored, some of them have been cut down. There's the added problem too, that the titles that we've got for them aren't Goya's. 
he never gave them titles. So these titles have been imposed on them by later commentators. So they are mysterious paintings. We're not sure if we've even sorted them out today. But what is clear is that these are examinations, if you like, of the absurdity of human nature, of the brutality of human nature. He's going over the themes of his life. He's going over his interest in witchcraft, the bizarre, the extraordinary, the unexplained. Technically, they have this extraordinary freedom and almost to the point of distortion. They're almost expressionist in the way that the, the faces seem to turn into all kinds of strange shapes. In these pictures, he is exploring that dark world, the world of the unconscious, the world of the hidden desires. It is unfortunate that the aging Goya was denied the chance to retire in the house of the deaf man. In 1823, after a brief period of liberal reform, the persecution of Spanish liberals and intellectuals resumed with vigor. By the end of 1824, Goya had moved to Bordeaux. It is little short of astonishing that an exiled 79-year-old artist now turned his hand to a completely new printing technique, lithography. In 1827, while still in Bordeaux, Goya painted this engaging canvas, The Milkmaid of Bordeaux, the final achievement of his long career. What's remarkable about the, this very late portrait is that it does bear the hallmarks of that kind of empathy, that naturalism. In technical terms, I mean, you can still see how well he's using short brushstroke, impasto, how he designs the two-way curve of the shawl to create a kind of rhythm. This is an extraordinary achievement for such a late work. It's very difficult to equate the artist who painted the black paintings with the freshness and vibrancy of the milkmaid of Bordeaux. It doesn't seem the work of an elderly artist at all. It seems you know, very optimistic and highly coloured. Goya died in Bordeaux on April the 15th, 1828. He was 82 years old and had been deaf for the last 35 years of his life. One of the unifying factors between Goya's time and our own is how many people don't like Goya's art. There are beautiful colours there, there is beauty there, but it's a very different kind of beauty. And it's also somebody who is absolutely determined to show things as they are. Perhaps that's what attracts modern artists to him, this feeling that we do live in a very threatening world, and that Goya was perhaps one of the few 18th, 19th century artists to recognize this and to portray it in a particular way. He's an artist of brilliance and versatility across media, across genres, across types and moods of painting but he's also an artist of immense imaginative scope, of immense technical mastery, and someone whose ability to create enigma, to create mystery, and to use imaginative powers and technical powers together, I think is an inspiration to many, many artists after him. He's been a profound influence upon the entire modern tradition of painting, from Manet through to Picasso and beyond.